the Jaipur Literature Festival. We're so happy to see you all here at the Samvad tent for our very first session on day four of the festival. Um, I'd like to just make a couple of quick announcements. Just to um, please, please, if you don't mind, turn your phones to silent right this very second because it's a huge sign of respect for our panelists. And if you do need to take a call, if you could please just take it outside the tent, that would be much appreciated. Um, we are very, very proud to present Z Entertainment as our title partner and Nexa, who's come on board for the first time as our festival's associate partner. And our venue partners, thank you to Rajan Kilachand and the Bank of Baroda, to JCP Prize for Literature, the bookstore, which is managed by Full Circle, which you'll find next to Charvag venue. Our cause partner, Detol, Banega Swatch India, to Black and White, our celebrations partner. And thank you so much to Jan Michalski, the Aga Khan Foundation, the Getty Foundation, and J. Paul Getty Trust, British Council, Nordic Lights, Mahindra World City, Dove, Airtel, Kingfisher, Grover, CK Birla Hospitals, Avid Learning, um, and to all of those sponsors for believing in our festival and for the con their continued support. We couldn't put it on without you and particularly to our new partners this year, Population Foundation of India, Child Labor Free Jaipur Initiative, DMI Finance, Dell, Sun Village, Air India, Ola, O2 Sparkle, and Spami. Our publishers, Penguin, MIT Press, Westland, Oxford Dictionaries, Murti Classical Library of India, Harvard University Press, and HarperCollins. So the future of every festival depends on these growing relationships with our existing and our new sponsors, but most of all, our existing and new audiences. So we'd really like to thank our media partners, Red FM and Rajasthan's very own Patrika Group and Baskar Group for their generous support year after year, and our new partners, Business Standard, Outlook, and DNA. Finally, our social media partners, um, they're helping us to reach a wider audience all around the world, and we're very grateful to them, to Vayuz, Wattpad, and Lonchora, our podcast partner. So without further ado, I would love to introduce this very special first session that we have, Imagine Childhood Set Free. And we're very honored to have, uh, have with us today our panelists, Harsh Mander, Paro Anand, Ramesh Paliwal, Sanjoy Roy, and Sheraj Singh Be Bechan, who we've been assured is on his way from the entrance. Um, this very special session has been sponsored by Child Labor Free Jaipur Initiative, and it features some of India's leading social workers, child labor activists, and commentators. So if I could just introduce briefly our moderator, Hisham Mandal, and he will then introduce all of our other panelists as they, as they speak. He's the Executive Director for India and Child Protection at the Children's Investment Fund Foundation, and he's worked at the Government of India's National AIDS Control Program and set up a company, Wikimedia Foundation, uh, Foundations Operations in India, to drive free knowledge. So what a wonderful moderator we have to introduce our fabulous panelists. Thank you so much. Please, a warm welcome uh, to bring them to the stage. Yeah, we're going to make this uh, nice and short. Harsh uh, is uh, a, an author and uh, a, a civil society champion and, and also a social worker. Uh, he's also uh, been uh, involved in policy advisory. Harsh, why don't you come along? <laughs> Paro's uh, a, a wonderful author. You should uh, uh, pick up her books. One of the things that we found especially good in this audience, uh, for this panel, was that she's trying to tell the stories of real children uh, to those kids who are a little bit more privileged. So thank you. <laughs> Sanjoy is uh, an, an, an author. Uh, um, he's, he's worked a huge amount with, with, with street kids uh, and uh, and has like really insightful thoughts about this topic. Ramesh runs an extraordinary NGO in, um, in Jaipur called Tabar. We at the, uh, the fund, the foundation that I work for are privileged to, uh, to work with them. You know, I, I just had a few opening comments and the first one was that Jaipur Literature you know, Fest is awesome. They are amazing sessions. 
Uh, and the fact that you've chosen to come to this one, is, is, it, it means a lot to us. So thank you for, 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 for taking uh, uh, the, the time out uh, from uh, you know, the other wonderful panels uh, uh, that are there. We're going to try and make this um, as, as engaging as, as possible. But first, I just needed to get a sense of uh, the audience's expertise. So can I ask you to raise your hands if you've ever been a child? <laughs> Continue to be one. Amazing. Amazing. All right, excellent. So we have experts in the house. That is good to know. All right. Um, what, uh, what we wanted to talk about today was uh, the possibility of children experiencing childhood. Uh, and it sounds you know, like a, a, a little odd, but if you look at the statistics of what are out there, the government of India says that, as per the last census, there are five million kids who are classified as child labor. You can argue about the numbers, you know, NGOs will say between 25 to 100 million, there's between 50 to 100 million kids out of school, but this isn't about statistics. Uh, uh, this is about trying to understand what causes whatever's happened, but more critically, what are the solutions? What's the way forward? Um, Every time we see a situation of a child in a, in, 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 in a condition of child labor, and, and oftentimes uh, th they are brutalizing work conditions, they're exposed to physical and sexual and emotional uh, uh, violence, they're deprived of all kinds of rights, uh, including the basic ones like the right to, uh, to education or to food. Um, two or three things tend to happen. One is, you see the story and you feel something. But more times than not, you look away, you walk away. When the experiences of child labor are all around us, I had chai this morning, I don't know what the provenance of the tea leaves are. The phone that I have, I know could potentially have a child labor footprint. The, 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 the cotton in the shirt that I'm wearing might have it. So we want to talk about how we make people care, but it cannot be only about humanity, because compassion will only take you so far. What it needs to be is hard solutions. There needs to be a reason why everyone, every stakeholder involved, sees a personal benefit in the work that they do. And so that's how we're going to go through uh, 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 the conversations. And uh, can we, Laura, can we assume that we're starting off? Yes. Yeah, all right. So sorry, I'll just <coughs> take my chair there and... All right, so um, I'm gonna go in some kind of a sequence here and bear with me while uh, I, I try and craft this out. You're walking on the streets. There's a child that you see at, you know, 11 in the morning. The child's selling something. The child's obviously not in school. What do you do? Typically, and we've seen this happen to all of us, you sometimes wonder why that child is there. Uh, you sometimes um, you know, look back again, you give them something, you buy something, but the overwhelming re reaction of people is to just move on, you know, assume that they haven't seen it. It's almost like that child isn't a human being. Sanjo, I wanted to ask you with your work on, on, um, on, on, on with street kids, do we need to change it? Can we ever change it? E, uh, to begin with, thank you all very much for uh, getting us to do this panel. I think it's one of the most important issues. And as you said, how many of us have had a childhood? Every child has a right to a childhood. And the problem that we have today is in India, you're talking about people move on. They don't see. We don't see as a society that this is a child who's out there come cold, snow, heat, rain, summer, selling something 
Not that because he wants to sell or she wants to sell because they have no alternative to do so. I remember uh, some years ago, um, the Joint Secretary of then uh, SJE, the Society of Social Justice and Empowerment, which used to look after the ministry in charge, the Joint Secretary called me this just before the Commonwealth Games and says, uh, Sanjoy, what is this nonsense? Kya kar rahe aap log? What are your organizations doing? Do you know when my child goes down to the park, he has to play with these three children who are dirty? Some years ago when we started off at the New Delhi Railway Station, 30 years ago, we used to work in the library there. That used to be the space. The librarian objected to the kids being there because she said that they drank water from the water cooler. Looking forward into what, are the, what is the primary issue here? The primary issue here is that we all collectively have stopped feeling, have stopped seeing, and stopped realizing that a child has a right to a safe childhood, to a space which uh, they need to be safe and secure and don't suffer abuse, either physical or otherwise, have access to education, which is a law today, and have access to a meal. 70 years after India's independence, our politicians, civil society, and each one of us has failed our children. And this is going to come and bite us in the butt big time. There are 110 million children as per the last census out of school. Now, if you look at the multiplier effect of that into the future, it's enormous. We have to have solutions which are out of the box. We have to look at uh, ways to be able to engage. And it's not difficult. If each one of us takes on one child in our neighborhood, you solve the problem. Not difficult. Thanks for that. Um, Paro, I wanted to move. I wanted to move on. Absolutely, I wanted to move on to you. Um, you know, the the idea that that Sanjoy talks about about us caring for one child each, and imagine the transformational potential of that one. You've spent uh, a considerable period of time and effort to try and tell stories uh, to more privileged uh, in, in society, and we're going to have to find some way of connecting with them if we are to realize Sanjoy's, you know, everyone look after one more child. What's been your experience? Um, I, that and in response to, you know, what do you feel when you see that child on the street uh, selling something and that's child labor, even if we don't give it that name. But um, absolutely, yesterday I was on a panel where somebody said that if you haven't been through a thing, you cannot feel that pain. We have to feel that pain. Each one of us here have to feel that pain. And if we don't feel that pain, then we are lost already. And one of the weapons that I have found for making me and my reader feel that pain is to write from the skin, from the feet, from the dust and the wounds of, of children who are experiencing all kinds of disprivilege, all kinds of otherization. If we don't feel that pain, we're in grave danger. If we don't know, if we want to be included, then we have to be inclusive ourselves. If we want to be heard, we've got to hear the voices of these children, of these, what was the number? 110 million are out of school and therefore the, potentially on the streets. So when we took, I was working with tribal children in Madhya Pradesh. These are nomadic, a nomadic tribe called the Pardhis who are still treated as a criminal tribe. From the minute they are born, they are criminals. And so we were trying to create a bridge course for them to go into school. The parents weren't very happy with it because these children work and earn and help in in, in the work that the parents do. Much of that work is poaching of wildlife. But we tried to create this bridge course to have them into school. And when they were ready to go into mainstream school under the Right to Education Act, we were told time and time again by schools, these are not our children. They do not belong to us. We will not take them. 
these, all of them have to be our children, my children, your children, your children. Thanks, Baru. Um, I wanted to introduce uh, Shivraj Singh Bechanji. He's an, a, a professor in Delhi University, uh, but he's also written a really moving book about his experiences. And um, you know, some, some of this session will be in Hindi, and, and then some of it will, will, will be in English. Uh, Shivraj Singh, please. Uh, thank you very much. बचपन को मैं दो तरह से देखना चाह रहा हूँ। एक तो ये है कि जो मेरा खुद का एक्सपीरियंस है, क्योंकि मैंने मेरा बचपन मेरे कंधों पर, my childhood on my shoulders जो छापा है ऑक्सफोर्ड ने, तो मैंने कैसे क्यों कहा ये बात कि मेरा बचपन मेरे कंधों पर है? तो मैं अपना अनुभव और दो चीजें हैं कि एक तो मेरा निजी अनुभव और जो मेरा दृष्टि कोण है बच्चों के बारे में जो मैं देख रहा हूँ तो पहले तो मैं ये कहना चाहूँगा कि मेरे देश में बहुत से बच्चे शिक्षा से बंचित हैं जैसा कि अभी आप सुन रहे हैं लेकिन उसमें ये है कि अगर शिक्षा की बात भी हुई तो यहाँ तक कि बच्चे को स्कूल भेज देंगे लेकिन मेरी स्थिति और ज़्यादा ख़राब है ऐसा बच्चा कि जिसके माता पिता न हो या फिर जिसके घर में कोई पैसा न हो उसको पढ़ने के लिए भी कितना मुश्किल होगा मैं आपको उदाहरण देना चाहूँगा कि जब आ, मेरे पिता की मृत्यु हुई मैं पाँच साल का था और मेरी माँ इलिटरेट थी अनपढ़ थी कोई स्किल उसके पास नहीं थी कोई हुनर उसके पास नहीं था तो वो क्या करती तो उसके लिए मेरे नाना ने शादी रीमैरिज कराई तो रीमैरिज जिस व्यक्ति के साथ हुई उसने कहा कि मुझे औरत चाहिए बच्चे नहीं चाहिए ओनली बीबी चाहिए ये बच्चे नहीं चाहिए तो जब हम मुझे एक्सेप्ट नहीं किया तो मेरे नाना ने वहाँ से वापस लिया फिर रीमैरिज उसकी करी वहाँ देखिए कि उनके दो बच्चे थे तो उन्होंने सोशल प्रेशर में मुझे स्कूल भेजा कि चलो इसको स्कूल भेज देते थे तो प्राइमरी का कुछ अक्षर मैंने सीखे और टीचर से ये रिपोर्ट ली कि बच्चे कैसे पढ़ रहे हैं तो टीचर ने कहा कि ये जो आपका स्टेप सन है सौतेला बेटा है ये कुछ होनहार है ये बहुत तेज़ी से चीज़ों को पकड़ता है और आपका ये जो सगा है ये थोड़ा स्लो नर्लर है ये धीरे धीरे सीख रहा है तो ये रिपोर्ट मेरे खिलाफ गई बजाय मुझको तारीफ मिलने के खिलाफ इसलिए गई कि वो ये सोच रहे थे कि हम इसको तो सोशल प्रेशर में स्कूल भेज रहे हैं दिखाने के लिए कि भाई हम भेदभाव नहीं करते हैं डिस्क्रिमिनेशन नहीं कर रहे सौतेले बेटे के साथ लेकिन असल में हम अपने बच्चे को पढ़ाना चाहते हैं तो फिर उन्होंने कहा कि अब जब हमारा असली बच्चा नहीं पढ़ सकता तो इसको क्यों पढ़ाएं तो उन्होंने क्या किया किताबें फाड़ी पट्टी तोड़ी आग लगाई और उस दिन से स्कूल जाना बंद और उसके बाद मुझे बतौर चाइल्ड लेबर भट्टे पर कुछ पैसों के लिए बेच दिया दो साल के लिए कुछ पैसे लिए एडवांस और मुझे बेच दिया पढ़ना लिखना मेरा बंद हो गया मैं वहाँ से भाग आया अपने रिलेशन के लोगों के साथ से भाग के भी फिर कहाँ जाता क्योंकि मेरे लिए कोई हंसता नहीं था तो दिल्ली में मेरी एक मौसी रहती थी मैं मौसी के पास भेज दिया गया मौसा जी का एक जूतों का छोटा सा काम था और मेरे मौसेरे भाई उस समय पढ़ा करते थे बाद में वो एम हुए सी हुए लेकिन आप देखिए कि मैं उस वक्त दिल्ली में क्या करता था रगड़ाई करता था और होटल पर बर्तन साफ करता था गलियों में अखबार आवाज़ दे देकर बेचता था या नींबू बेचता था और आप देखिए कि उस जमान उस समय एक सरदार परिवार मुझे मिला जो मुझे गोद लेना चाहता था और मेरे मौसा जी ने कहा कि इसकी माँ से परमिशन नहीं है तो बच्चा गोद नहीं दिया जा सकता और उन्होंने मेरी माँ को चिट्ठी लिख दी तो माँ वहाँ से मुझे ले आई मैं आपको बताऊँ कि जब मैं थोड़ा होश संभाला तो मैं उस सरदार परिवार को राजौरी गार्डन ढूंढने गया तो वो मुझे कुछ नहीं मिला वहाँ वो गुजर भी गए होंगे मेरे पास कोई एड्रेस भी नहीं था मैं कोई पढ़ा लिखा भी उस तरह से नहीं था लेकिन एक दिल में ये बात थी कि किसी ने मुझसे पढ़ने के लिए कहा था किसी ने मुझसे अपना बच्चा बना लेने के लिए कहा था 
वो जज्बात की वजह से मैं उस परिवार को ढूंढता फिरा उस बारे में मैंने कहा भी लिखा भी दिल्ली भी छूट गई मुझे बता दीजिएगा जितना समय हो मैं हाँ तो दिल्ली भी छूट गई और मैं कैसे पढ़ा ये लंबी कहानी है भारत के संविधान में चौदह साल के बच्चों को कहा गया है कि उनको ऐसे किसी काम में नहीं लगाया जाए जिससे उनका स्वास्थ्य पर बुरा प्रभाव पड़ता हो लेकिन ये आप देखिए कि मुझे तो चौदह साल से पहले स्कूल का मुँह ही देखने को नहीं मिला मैं तो एक अध्यापक की कृपा से जब मैं कविताएं करने लगा गांव में और उससे प्रभावित हो के एक बार मैंने प्राइवेट छठी का परीक्षा दे दी और फिर आठ में मैं एडमिशन डायरेक्ट हुआ मेरा और ये जो मैंने कहानी लिखी मेरा बचपन मेरे कंधों पर वो सिर्फ दसवें तक है और मैं जब दसवा पास करके निकल गया तो फिर मैं लेबर भी करता रहा और पढ़ता भी चला गया फिर आगे तो मैं पीएचडी भी कर गया डीलीट भी कर गया दिल्ली विश्वविद्यालय का प्रोफेसर बन गया दस पाँच किताबें भी लिख डाली अखबार में रेगुलर कॉलम लिख रहा हूँ तीस पच्चीस तीस साल से मेरा बचपन मेरे कंधों पर के अलावा भी बहुत सारा लिखने का मौका मिला अब मैं अपनी बात छोड़ता हूं मैं ये कहना चाहता हूं कि मेरे देश में ये संभव नहीं है अभी कि बच्चों को सरकारें या कोई एनजीओ अपने खर्चे पर पूरी तरह से पढ़ा दे तो मेरा विचार ये है कि जो बच्चे मेरे जैसे हैं लाभार्थ हैं या सक्षमा रहते हैं हरिमंदर जी बैठे उन्होंने बहुत काम किया है मैं जानता हूँ तो उनसे थोड़ा सा काम भी लिया जाए और पढ़ने भी दिया जाए ताकि वो और थोड़ा काम लिया जाए जैसे आप देखते हैं हम बाहर विदेशी में कनाडा में अमेरिका में कि बच्चे पढ़ते हैं तो दो एक घंटे वो काम भी कर सकते हैं उसका कारण यह है कि मेरे देश में जो बच्चे श्रम करते हैं उन बच्चों से श्रम न करने वाले बच्चे नफरत करते हैं उनको हीन दृष्टि से देखते हैं तो चाहे अमीर का बच्चा हो या गरीब का बच्चा हो थोड़ा सा उसको जो सिर्फ पढ़ते हैं काम नहीं करते उनको थोड़ा सा काम घंटे दो घंटे और जो सिर्फ काम ही करते रहते हैं पढ़ते नहीं हैं उनको थोड़ा पढ़ने का मौका दिया जाए चूँकि मैं ये समझता हूँ कि जो श्रम करते हैं उनमें उन उनमें उन भी प्रतिभा होती है उनको मौका मिले तो वो ज़्यादा काम कर सकते हैं और वो देश की सेवा करने लायक बन सकते हैं ऐसा sure. मैं सोचता हूँ sure. बातें बहुत हैं समय के हिसाब से मैं कम करूँ सो जस्ट टू ट्रांसलेट फॉर हाउ मनी पीपल डोंट अंडरस्टैंड सो जस्ट टू क्विकली ट्रांसलेट अ चाइल्ड हुड ऑन हिज शोल्डर द बुक दैट ही रोट it's about his life his his father died when he was very young uh, his grandfather decided to get his mother remarried when they took the proposal the other family said that they were fine taking on the the his mother but they didn't want the kids so he then went back to his uh, grandparents place aapke went back to his grandparents place after a while Uh, the, uh, his mother got married he went to his uh, uh, step uh, father's place they had a kid the kid and he was sent to school he was primarily sent to school because of social pressure not because they wanted to in school he was very very smart his step brother was a slow learner so when the teachers gave this information that he was super smart and very easy for him to pick up on stuff they looked at it as a problem they tore his books they burned his papers saying that no if our kid can't learn he cannot learn either he then ran away came to delhi worked in various restaurants washed dishes uh, so on and so forth sorry he was first sold aapko pehle becha gaya he was first sold into child slavery for 2 years where he worked he then ran away from there came to delhi worked in restaurants etc i uh, didn't have a place to uh, to to learn uh, a couple a, a sikh gentleman and his wife were very keen to adopt him because they thought he was smart his mosa his uh, his uncle and aunt who were in delhi where he was with they then wrote to the mother saying this is a couple who want to adopt him are you okay with it she said no came back to him back to the village and he said that he hadn't studied so it was only when he started writing poetry he was then he then went to school he continued to work alongside it uh he was he gave his 8th standard examination completed till 10th standard and that's basically what his life's journey has been so truly in many ways much of what we see across the world the solution that he is offering is that our law today says that up to 14 you cannot work 
14 upwards, you can work in a safe environment. The problem is that young people, that kids and the employers, the employers make the kids work eight or 10 hour shifts, as we know in matchmaking and many of the other unorganized industry. His point is that irrespective of whether you're poor or rich, there should be a program whereby all young people from the age of 14 at least work for two hours, be it in community development, uh, uh, learning a skill, et cetera. So there's no discrimination between the poor and the rich. In the same way that uh, young people who are, who are from the middle class or wealthy learn through uh, uh, an entire period, they too should have a thing of inculcating work into their practice. So that's the advice that he's given, given his childhood, whatever. Thank you, Jo Apne Sabke Saat Share Kya, Uske Le Bhot Bhot Danyavad. Ash wanted to come in. So, just, um, you know, right at the end, uh, he touched on a really complicated problem that's there, which is uh, child labor doesn't happen because people are cruel. Child labor happens because of circumstances, because of poverty, because of. Uh, uh, a lack of opportunity, but even deeper than that is just absolute helplessness. This is all I've got. And again, I'm coming back to what you do on the rationalizing front. When you see uh, a, a child in a chai stall, um, and then you say, should that child be there? And then the counter argument is, kam se kam ko, you know, khana to mil rahe. at least the little one gets a, a, a meal. And do you have the right to play God in a sense uh, uh, with that? And, I, and I'm bringing these up because these are really hard uh, uh, questions. And I think right at the end, um, what, what, what you're counseling for is to say that every right has some, every child has some fundamental rights, one of which is the right to education. If, as the law of, of our country says, if you are able to deliver the rights of education, and if there is the need to work for a limited amount of time in safe working conditions, uh, there's nothing fundamentally wrong with that. And I think it's it's humbling that a child, you know, a former child laborer is 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 is, is making the case for that. Um, Ramesh, I want to come to you before I come to uh, Harsh in a moment. What do we do about any of this if the numbers are so big and the problem is so you know all prevalent almost? Uh, and this isn't one of those issues that pop up in the newspapers. Uh, in, in Delhi, where I live, you know, if, if Uber search pricing goes up, you know, it reaches the front pages. If the onion prices go up, it reaches uh, uh, front pages. But the, you know, the ongoing emergency with children reaches nowhere. Um, how do NGOs respond? What can we do? I mean. Uh my moral experience actually, it was involved with the children coming from the other state for the Bengals making actually, because I came to know in 2011, there are children coming from all over this India in Jaipur to make the, to learn actually how to make the Bengals, because Jaipur is becoming hub since 2011. And it was earlier another city of Uttar Pradesh, Firojabad, I think. So a lot of rescue happened, and then actually the children came to Jaipur. As a role of NGO, because why we are working for these children? Because they are living in a most pathetic condition. Five o'clock, they get up in the morning. Nine, uh, 11 o'clock in the night, they go to sleep. They are not allowed to take the shower because of that. They are suffering with the scabies. They cannot walk because they are continuously sitting. Their eyesight because they are working in a very dark places. I mean, we have some uh, pockets in Jaipur. Continuously, rescue is going on. And these are always tortured by the employer because they need to produce more. This iron road, if child, they don't work, they don't produce, they don't work with the quality, employer will touch their body. I know one case, I mean, the employer, he, so kafi mara gaya tha, so his spine was hurt. And he was actually advised by doctor, I mean, after rescue, when he came to our children home, Jarase moment pe, he could go in a kind of paralysis attack. So 
that kind of condition actually that motivates us to continuously working for these children. What we do, I mean, I'm talking about the most worst condition of the children. In that, actually, we try to give all the, uh, what they need, actually, so as the safety, security, good accommodation, psychological support, because they are psychological, emotionally broken. They need a first medical checkup, because so many medical issues are with them. And, and most important, what we do for these uh, kind of child labor, uh, rescue children, that uh, we had them, we come out with a traumatic situation where they were always have a fear that somebody will beat us, somebody will, I mean, if we are, we are not doing anything, we have to do, we have to do for others. So it's kind of informal slavery or maybe formal slavery. So we help them to come out through the drama where they speak, where they share, where they participate, where they experience, where they come out from the low stream to normal self-esteem. They feel happiness and sad, actually. And they, I think, when we say that the time is a I mean, time is a big reveal, relief. So when will that time come? How will it I think these are the activities which help them to catch that. And I mean, to coming from, shift from the past to present situation. I think that one of the things that we have done with all the I mean, we should uh, try this theater and drama activity. And, and actually, we learn, actually, one of my colleagues, Shaina, she learned art based therapy. They need these kind of therapies because I'm telling you, they are emotionally broken. Or maybe they lost their self esteem, confidence. They are just working for others. They are habitual to do like that. So we have to take them out with that situation, of that emotional situation. सबसे ज्यादा जो पसंद करते हैं जब ड्रामा टीचर एंटर होता है क्लास में अपने आप एक आवाज निकलता है ये आई थिंक व्हाट दे नीड एक्चुअली दे नीड दिस काइंड ऑफ एक्टिविटीज टू कम आउट आई थिंक थैंक यू आई सो सो वी हैव अ सेंस ऑफ व्हाट द इशू माइट बी एंड वी हैव अ सेंस दैट एज इंडिविजुअल्स यू नो आवर इनर कंपैशनेट वॉइसेस आर स्पीकिंग how, do, however, do we get policymakers, stakeholders, uh, uh, the government, corporates, you know, uh, anybody who could, the judiciary, the police, how do we get the larger group of people who can actually effect change on the ground uh, to, to, to understand this issue, but to understand it from a deeply selfish point of view, and I mean selfish in a really good way. How does, for example, the Minister of Commerce or the Secretary of Commerce look at the issue of child labor as something that can actually support uh, uh, India's uh, uh, competitiveness globally? I, I'm, I'm going to ask Harsh to, to talk, leaning on two of his past lives. Uh, one is the policy wonk, uh, and the second is somebody who's worked on the ground. So, how do f policy makers uh, respond and how can we make a better case for them? Uh, I think the, the first thing that I wanted to say is why, why is India not doing enough or almost nothing for its children and even now the law has actually been turned around to, to actually expand uh, the legality of child labor. I think we need to understand is that culturally we have an enormous comfort level with inequality. Uh, the idea that that the accident of our birth, which is ultimately karma, the idea karma, of caste. Karma. Caste and karma, that the accident of your birth justly determines whether you'll have a childhood at all, whether you'll survive. Uh, and therefore, you know, these years of work in and outside government and directly with homeless kids uh, has taught me many things. But one of them is not just the equality, equality of every child, not just equality of, of rights but the equality of potential. And therefore, the next time you go to a, a dhaba and a, a young boy is serving you tea, just look at his face and think that, wow, you know, maybe if this boy had the same life chances as you and I had, maybe he would have been a philosopher, he might have been a great scientist, he might have been a poet, who knows? Uh, I uh, came into you know this in many different ways, but when I left the civil service, uh, I, I worked primarily with 
people uh, who were affected by hate, uh, hate violence after 2002. But I also felt that we needed to understand what is a society which is built on hate and what is a society that is built on love. And, and it is really this work, and so my, I made a call to young people and uh, many of them volunteered, and then we said, let's, let's look at who's the most disadvantaged person living in our city. And they decided that it was the homeless child. And I said, how much do we know? And, and they went out, but briefly we, we learned that, that every, of course every street child is, is a working child. And it seemed overwhelming. There are 50,000, 60,000 of these children on the streets. Uh, it seemed as if it, it, it was not, uh, there was no solutions. But we have learned actually that, that with, with love and with an assurance of love, it is possible to, to reclaim their childhoods completely. And, uh, and I've learned now it's 10 years, these kids are growing into adults, and uh, if I had the time, I could tell you many stories, but they give you pride and, and they, sh they teach you the intrinsic equality of children. But in terms of policy, and I think that's what you wanted me to bring in, I would have much rather stayed with the stories which both I write and, and so on. But I think from the policy perspective, I need to say two things. The first of them is that I, I was a member of the National Advisory Council, which was advising the Prime Minister, and we were trying to build a, a, a law which was much stronger on child labor. And I was amazed that we got a formal response from the government saying India cannot go the whole way with regard to abolishing child labor because India's comparative advantage is the fact that children uh, are paid much less and therefore on the exports. And so India's growth will be affected if we abolish child labor. And this was formally communicated. And I said, do we really want to build India's growth on the thin shoulders of, of working children? But I think that an even more profound problem with that argument is the idea, and you know, we, we believe and rationalize child labor saying that as long as there's poverty, parents have no option, let them make their children work. So poverty is the cause of child labor. What I've learned and from people like Shanta Sinha is actually the reverse is much more true. That child labor is, is, is really the cause of poverty. Because if, you, if a child is not given the opportunity to have a, an education, uh, her, his, his or her parents are, are working in a brick kiln, are living the most uh, you know, miserable of lives, uh, and their child is, is deprived of any opportunity to break out of that, so the only way to break out of poverty is actually to give the child, uh, under the, the worst of circumstances, a the chance of a decent education, and then the child can break out. And, and, and I think that's, that's one thing. And, and the last thing was about street children. S Sanjoy uh, uh, and I, I think, share this love for street children uh, and, and, and their potential and, and what can happen. But I learned, you know, I wanted to look at a big solution. And I learned this from somebody called Sister Cyril. She's an Irish nun working in Sialda. And she was working, uh, she, she, she had a middle class school, uh, a convent school, uh, Loreto Convent. And one day, uh, a, a street girl this big uh, got raped just outside the gates of her school. And she had a, an epiphany. And she said, you know, actually my school is empty 16 hours a day. And those are the very hours in which a homeless child is most vulnerable. So actually, this is the space. And so she said, I'll build an extra story uh, to my school, and every homeless girl has the right to come and stay here. And then every, uh, every period, she had child-to-child -child teaching. So one class would go up and teach another child, and the child got bridged. It took about 12 to 18 months for a child to be ready to actually join uh, the school. And that was all it took. So I said, can we take that idea to the government school system, which is much harder? And so that's the, the challenge that uh, I decided to adopt. We have now about 60 schools across the country, which are government schools which have been converted. It costs very, very little to, to refurbish a government school into, uh, into a residential space. And it's absolutely beautiful for both sets of kids because this a child with a family and a child uh, without a family or a home actually learn to, to live and grow up together and, and, and learn 
to accept difference and, and so on. So I believe, you know, in Hindi films you have this story that, you know, for one day you become uh, prime minister and so I, I sometimes play that fantasy. So I've just become prime minister for one day, what would I do? Actually would do two things. One was a common school system and that's, you know, having a good quality school where uh, uh, every child uh, studies together, Hindu, Muslim, rich, poor, uh, uh, working, non-working, and, and upper caste, lower caste. But the other thing that I would do is to convert every school in the country into a residential school for children who, who cannot have a childhood without a place of protection, which is street children and working children. Hishab, can I just uh, add to, uh, to Harsh, and, and, and perhaps, I don't know whether I should be saying this, perhaps you all don't know that, because Harsh was seen to be on the other side of the present narrative, the minute he, uh, the minute the new uh, uh, government came into place four or five years ago, all the work that they had done, especially in Hyderabad, Harsh had to then sign off and step down as trustee so that that could continue without them looking and signaling out uh, his institutions as something to attack. And of course, they continue to see him to be the other, and so on and so forth. So uh, these are policies that need to work across. And just to react in terms of what corporates can do, uh, Nana Lal Kidwa is sitting here. When she was at the HSBC, HSBC, I think worldwide, uh, certainly in Southeast Asia and South Asia, had a program where they said, we will focus on street children. Similarly, uh, Yasmin uh, Premji and Azim Premji, uh, a cocktail party conversation, I think it was in Jaipur 10 or 11 years ago when Yasmin said, you know, Sanjay, we have all of this money. We want one. What do you think we should do? Do we give it to the arts? And I said, whatever you do, be focused and only give it to that. And they have continued now to support uh, uh, children, education in an enormous way across the length and breadth of the country. And we need many more such people to create these focus programs. And Az going Az Azim Premji is actually supporting our school. Absolutely. This conversion of government schools into... Yeah. Uh, and just that last thing, just to add, what are the other issues? Amit Sen is standing there and, you know, what you talked about, the problem. One of the biggest issues that we have across India, and it's a ticking time bomb, is really mental health. Because we don't see it and our legs are not fractured or you don't have diarrhea, mental health across the adult population, people who don't have access to mental health, the stigmas, and of course, like you said, with kids, it is an enormous problem. We got Amit to relocate. We cajoled him to come back from Newcastle about 20 years ago and he set up uh, our mental health program at Salam Balak Trust, which has ensured that our kids have been able to achieve and if you see these tents, uh, the head of our production, uh, uh, Sunil, who's designed everything that you see around, who owns a, earns a six-figure salary, mm. completed his master's uh, uh, MA. The guy who does all your back end, all of the technology that we do is Anand, who used to be also a street kid from Salam Balak Trust. Given, <laughs> given a platform, as Harsh said, given an equitable platform, and education, these kids can achieve just about anything. Yep. The problem is that we don't think that they can, yep. and we make them go and do candle making and cycle repair and whatever else. Yep. Yep. Well, thanks for that. Without knocking uh, candle making. But, yeah. we I, I, just, I just wanted to very quickly just add to that one sentence that you said, so how do we create that? And I, I think, and I have seen, that one way to create it is through stories where you're taking those stories of these very kids and of these very achievements to the very, very privileged who will go on to be policy makers in the future uh, because we can only do so much right now and that needs to continue and stories are my weapon of choice. Yeah. I'm going to wrap up in a couple of minutes and, and we'll open it for questions uh, but I was going to make an ask before you give your question, tell us something that you can do differently starting tomorrow. You know, you could follow Harsh's model of if I was prime minister for a day, or if you were yourself for a day, what would you do? Just think about it, because you have ideas about making, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, work uh, almost compulsory for, for, for everyone for, for a couple of hours, and, and, and there's lots of interesting ideas that have come. There's something really special that's happening in, in Jaipur uh, around
around this issue, and I wanted to just talk about it. We've all got a sense of the complexity of the issue. We've all got a sense of you need a multi-pronged approach to it. What Child Labor Free Jaipur is trying to do is to actually show that there is a way that, Sanjay, carrying your example forward, that businesses can do uh, well by doing good. Think about many of us are tourists to the city. You come to this extraordinarily beautiful city. You're coming here to see the culture, the art, the, the music, the food, etc. And then what goes through your mind when you run into a child laborer? It makes you uncomfortable. But the fact is you also don't really have much of a choice. You either choose not to come to Jaipur and go somewhere else. What else do you get to do? So a number of organizations and governments have gotten together. And what we're saying is, is there a way that you can create an island of hope? And that island of hope is Jaipur. And it's the handicrafts industry. I want to tell you three or four components of it. There are 50,000 children who are making all of the gorgeous bangles that you can buy outside. That's not right. Most of them come from Bihar. So there's a partnership that's being built between the Rajasthan and the Bihar governments to make sure that kids get rehabilitated back to their families. So that's one component of it. The second component is to work with businesses and show them that you can operate child labor free and you can operate profitably. If we succeed in building the child labor free brand uh, in, uh, in Jaipur, it'll do two things. One is, hopefully, consumers will pay for the product, and they will need to pay a little bit more because labor costs will go a little bit higher. But there might actually be more tourists in Jaipur. I mean, imagine in, 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 in you know, cities in India and, and outside, if, if you suddenly have this ad floating around saying, come visit Jaipur. It was India's most gorgeous city. It's also India's first child labor free city. The infrastructure exists. You will see increased air bookings that weekend. That's how powerful this is. So do keep an eye for open for child labor free Jaipur. Please ask wherever you go uh, about wh what the source of, of uh, the product was. You have the right as citizens and consumers to make change, and you can push for it. So please do that. There are roaming mics around the place uh, if you raise your hand and Laura will point me at the right direction so we try and get a mix of folks the lady there um, yeah hello everybody uh, I'm an architect by profession and five years ago I was doing my thesis over my final jury and I had done a couple of case studies and my topic was juvenile rehabilitation center so for my case study I had gone to a live uh, juvenile rehab and I had questioned a couple of kids that what led you to do this? And the answer that I got had, like, I didn't have words to describe. What I was guiding him was that, you know, you study hard, make a good life for yourself. He replied to me, my elder brother is a BA pass. He is literally striving to make ends meet. What, and he had got into a juvenile rehab just because he had counterfeited notes at that young age. He's like, my brother earns about 12, 15,000 a month. I can do that with only one job. I'll just do this one job, and he'll, I can get that more money than him. So why even bother to study? So what I noted was the child loses his innocence yeah. at the situations that surround him. The child loses his innocence. So I guess in India, the main root cause is the child losing his innocence. So how to retrieve that back? So that's another very important point that. Sure, sure. Uh, did you have it? I mean, were you? Uh, maybe I, I can. I think let's let's do that. Yeah. So it's a question there. Maybe the gentleman. I'll respond to that in a second. Uh, yeah. You know, in fact, Punita is sitting there, standing there. She can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I'd like to respond. Okay. To that. As he said. What I'm planning to do, or someone is planning to do, of course, after 15 months, I am planning to do some project for the, uh, for the uh, child labor working for their study. After my 15 months, I retired, so after planning for that since now. But now, coming to that law, when 1947 to 49, the Constitution was made, 
our they would have not thought the population explosion in india and the psyche which is going on and the country resources being looted by few people so this problem of child labor we, it is ideally we can speak childless uh, child labor free country or the nation or the city or jaipur but practically it is not possible right we have been seeing it various places we can talk ideally on many fields but it will not be but what my saying just now he said we have to grow with this idea ki suppose like here cd for the bengal industry they are living in a very pathetic condition working it but if we give them a protection ki okay you can have but give them a some respectful living also so the uh, the factory owner yeah. will employ them for the cheaper rate but give them a some respectful life but because of the uh, fear of law he is keeping them under sure. the dark shade so, so he is not letting them to live their life so my aim is just to say yeah. that not going with the ideal condition of law yeah. which uh, we make it but every time we can't follow so sure. so we should go by a media yeah. Uh, so so your, yours is a challenge I, saying child labor free may not happen can, can, I, can, I, can I just, just yeah. i just have to come come through my my, my friend uh, i absolutely disagree with you absolutely. there has to be no halfway house there is yes. the halfway house is something that we've lived on that's the been the rationalization right through child labor is not inevitable every child has to get an equal chance and even then it will never be an equal chance i mean even if a child studied get got the same education as your you and I, your and my child they still have parents who are living in extreme poverty who are not educated and all the other struggles we have to give them an equal chance and it's possible to do so i as a teacher i worked with you know i've been a teacher of ias uh, i was in the academy uh, i have i teach at the iim amdabad and i have taught these homeless kids i can tell you now after 10 years there is absolutely no difference and i say this to the i am kids and they look me at me i say actually i see no difference in potential no. uh, between the kids that we are raising from the streets and you it's just a difference of opportunities you are here because a billion people in this country did not get the life chances that you did so i feel no 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 compromise on this all right thank and you and i endorse that yeah. no 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 <laughs> And uh, bangle uh, making uh, is a hazardous industry. No matter how much light they have and how much food they have, yeah. it's still a hazardous industry. Would they have the Can't gentleman in the it. green? Um, if instead of waiting for the mic, if you can shout it out. Okay, there you go. Uh, yeah. I'm a, uh, a child psychiatrist, uh, and I work in I work in Bhutan, helping with the development of child mental health services and child protection services. One of the things I that I, in terms of what can be what can uh, what can we do uh, i i would like to have a talk with amit wh whoever amit is um, but let me say this india is exporting child labor uh, the way that happens in bhutan is a lot of the infrastructure is contracted to indian companies and they employ indian families who live in col small colonies tent colonies basically Bhutan, for its own citizens, has, has a policy of, um, of universal education. The policy technically is supposed to extend to these families, but it doesn't. What I, my question is, is, are there people in India who are, are going to be able, who, can, who can, I can contact or who we, can help us to, um, uh, to deal with the child labour that's happening in Bhutan sure. among the uh, the Indian indented labourers families. Sure. The um, Queen Mother is the solution. She's she's very empathetic. She's a storyteller. You should really appeal to her to make sure that this gets included. Yeah. Uh, the Queen Mother. Um, and she, that's really there's, the solution there. Sure. There's a couple of other questions. I want to just uh, for anybody who's under 18. Is there anyone under 18 who has a question? We're running out of time. I'm going to ask a couple of the adults a question, and then I'm going to make sure that we go to you, okay? The lady in the front there. Yeah. First of all, thanks for raising this very important and uh, social issue. My question to the distinguished panel is, what are your views on laying onus of uh, ensuring a safe childhood on the parents? The reason why I say this is I have a housekeeper uh, who is uneducated herself, and she and her husband are doing every bit to educate four of their children. And there are other cases where people... You know, they just get
get away with the responsibility. So what are your views on the response, the primary responsibility of ensuring safe childhood on the parents? Sure. And then one last question there. Uh, yeah. No, get yeah, if you give her a mic, please. So my question is around how can we replicate the good stuff that is happening so that everyone isn't reinventing the wheel? And I come at this from seeing some of the amazing work that Sanjoy and the Sanam Balak Trust has done in Delhi, and you've heard some of it, but they never talk enough about it. From some of the work which he alluded to that we were supporting at HSBC across different street children projects, and the big frustration I've always had across the NGO communities is how little we work together to replicate best practice rather than reinventing the wheel each time. So suggestions on how we might do that. We're doing this in sanitation, by the way. Yeah. We've set up the India Sanitation Coalition. Yeah. So can you create a coalition for working in replicating best practice uh, amongst so short yourself? answer, we can and we should. Uh, yeah. But we will come to that. The, uh, the young lady here in yellow. Hello, yeah. my name is Renisha and I am 12. I have a question that how can a privileged child sensitize himself or herself to feel about an unprivileged child? Okay, we'll give you a Thank you for asking that question. Thank you a lot. Um, All right, now let's start getting some answers out of the way. Can we go to her question first? Mine, mine overlaps, which is uh, I'm working in a school. Ah, okay. um, you mentioned trying to reach the privileged population as well. So I work in a school outside of Delhi that serves um, many students from the privileged sector. Um, and we strongly have this service learning mission. We have a citizenship center where students design projects. But we're also very um, interested in making sure that they're real and meaningful and not just one-off charity events or raising sympathy in, in young people or making them feel discouraged but not empowering them as they become adults and leaders in this society to be active change makers in the most effective and the right ways. So the other side of her question as an adult designing curriculum and programming and service learning projects, advice from you to make this real and, and, and meaningful and actually affect change, not just raising sympathy or charity. All right, we absolutely have no time for uh, any more questions, but the panelists are going to be around, so do catch them. There's, uh, I want to start with an answer to her question, uh, and I don't know if it's uh, Harsh or Sanjay who can, who can take that. Uh, uh, I, I want both to you and to you. I, I do feel, I've learned with our children many things, uh, uh, but one of them is that they don't want charity. And they don't deserve charity. They don't want your sympathy. No, no sympathy. No Please sympathy keep the at sympathy. all. No charity at all. And I learned this. I mean, uh, I've done many things in my life, but what I'm most proud of is that 300 children call me Papa. And I think that is because, and, and that sense of, of assurance. And right in the beginning, I used to see they'd, they'd eat something and then they'd put it into your mouth. And if there was a, a, even a little bit of hesitation, then, then you've lost the whole journey. So it is, we have to create egalitarian spaces where children of privilege go and work with children who are, who are disadvantaged, not for charity and vice versa, but because they, they have a great deal to learn from the child who's lived, lived a difficult life and still kept her, her head above. Uh, so so just, just create egalitarian friendly spaces, I think, where they can meet as equals. Can I give an example? So, Punita, during, for the Jaipur Literature Festival, we work with about 60 children, uh, half from privileged backgrounds and half from NGOs like Dusra, Dasha, and so on and so forth. They come together for a week. In, initially, the children from the privileged schools look at these kids as, you know, problem. By the end, these same kids look at these kids as the hero because when these kids share their stories, they're like, oh my God, we would never have ever experienced something like this. So schools need to do much more of that using, as you said, theater uh, and the arts to be able to make that possible. Otherwise, it won't happen. And going back to Nana, Nana, people like you and me, of course, and all of us need to create a CII and a FICI for the social sector, make, bring all of it together do it with dynamism as opposed to please give to charity. We need to be driving and looking at policy. The only way we can do it is if we have 
that kind of institution so that it prevents governments from time to time targeting NGOs as the other NGOs to be frightened of, NGOs being part of civil society movements and looking at us with fear and hatred and having blacklists, yeah. irrespective of which government is in power. Sure. Um, Ramesh, I just want to go specific back to that question about how do we get uh, the, this community to work with each other. Because right now, there are 500 NGOs working on 500 different drafts of 500 different policies of the same, uh, same issue. Well, I think uh, uh, I would like to share experience of Jaipur, what we are doing right now. Uh, and I've been given a sign of one minute, so if you <laughs> can make it 30 seconds, okay, and I, I just want to talk to her. Okay. Uh, I mean, we are working on the eradication of ch uh, child labor. And uh, in that, actually, we need more stakeholders. I think uh, what, what is more important that, I mean, all the people who want to help a child, they are stakeholders. I mean, not others. We should not see these others' problem, actually. So we, should, we have to involve in that. So 20 or 25 departments are involved in that. There is a district child labor task force committee, for example. And after six years, they have their meeting. Civil society organization, they are joining day by day. 10-15 NGOs, they were working in isolation, most of the departments also. But now they are working together. And each and every month, when we have a meeting, more people are coming. They are joining. Recently, we have sent 165 children to Bihar. I mean, all the organization, all the departments, they came together and they just worked, actually. <laughs> the thing is that isolation is, is still there. They are not working with the willpower. We need to work on that. But things are happening. Sure. So right. I think we can take as an example of that. And sure. I think the, to answer the two questions about you're working in privileged schools, you're studying in one, is to raise that awareness uh, and replace sympathy with empathy, and from there to inclusion. And it's not, it's not as complicated as it sounds. You know, it's in the little things, it's in the little acts uh, that, that you do that the change will come. Thank you so much. I want to leave you with one last thought, which is that in all of this, in part addressing your question, but yours as well, sir, if you approach it as if this was my child, would I do differently? Would I think differently? Would I respond differently? And if you're not a parent, everyone has a child in their lives that they love. If that child uh, was the one that you were looking at, would you have done differently? As long as you keep doing that and vote with your wallets, things can change. Thank you so much. Please, please join me in giving a very, very warm thank you to our amazing panelists. Harsh Mander, Paro Annan, Ramesh Paliwal, Sanjoy Roy, Sherar Singh Bechan, and our wonderful moderator, Hisham Mundal. Thank you so much, everybody. Ra warm round of applause. If I could also let anyone here know who's a delegate, we're having a special event at the DLF Lounge. If you want to interact with a bunch of our wonderful speakers, you're so welcome between 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. You could drop by the DLF Lounge if you're a delegate. And Chike Frankie Adosian will be there.